Reports of wild boar at large in Alberta can be called to 310-FARM-3276 or emailed to af.wildboar at gov.ab.ca. Travis Black gives his presentation on feral and wild pig ID. Uh, please put that in the chat function and I will try to address that. And, and Marty, please interrupt me if you do get questions. That's just fine. So. With that said, I'm going to jump into my presentation. And I, I think it's important that we always understand kind of the history of domestication um, and where these wild and feral pigs came from. Um, Wild pigs inhibited Europe, most of Asia and North Africa with very distinct differences between the geographically separated populations. Um, around 5500 BC, a few uh, domesticated, and you'll note I put that in quotation marks, uh, wild pigs start to show up in southeastern Europe. Um, typically, those are the warty pig subspecies um, in the southern Europe and true wild pigs to the north of Sus scrofa scrofa. Uh, Southeast Asian pigs uh, occupied uh, by warty pigs, primarily Indian wild boar and banded pigs. And about 10,000 years ago, pigs started showing up in New Guinea. These uh, papal pigs express both traits of the warty pigs and the banded pigs. So the most primitive of our modern domestic pigs seem to be those papal pigs. Um, and about a thousand years later, the oldest domestic pigs were found in Asia Minor and the Near East, which is kind of the starting point of their spread to Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, secondary domestication, which is defined as catching of wild pigs and subsequent crossbreeding with those early domestic stock, rapidly multiplied stocks uh, across Europe and started shifting their appearance, that, that outward kind of phenotypic appearance, towards that of the European wild boar. It's important to note, though, that this crossbreeding and, and domestication did not change the number of chromosomes that these pigs display. Southeast Europe and Asian pigs have the same chromosome number as domestic pigs, which is 36 chromosomes. Central European wild pigs have 38 chromosomes. And pigs, because of crossbreeding amongst these wild populations, can actually have any, anywhere from 36, 37, or 38 chromosomes. Um, the polymorphic variation can result in the one or two chromosomal pairs fusing. Thus, you get 37 chromosomes. Uh, a pig with 36 chromosomes can be a wild boar or a hybrid. One with 37 can be a wild boar, hybrid, or domestic. And a pig with 38 chromosomes could be any of the four morphotypes, which include wild, feral, hybrid, and domestic. Um, I wanted to show this map real quickly. It just kind of shows where those, those wild populations of pig existed in uh, Europe and Asia, uh, which is kind of the base for a lot of the domestication of pigs and the spread across the world. And just so you understand the, the species that I'm referring to, um, there's a lot more that I could have shown. I, I kind of narrowed it down to a handful of a few. Uh, they have a, a very characteristic look to them that we'll get into when I start talking about the morphological differences. Um, this is a Central European boar or Sus scrofa scrofa. Um, very typical of pigs that you'll find in Europe. Um, these photographs actually were taken in Germany. This is more of a Russian boar or a, a Sus scrofa sibericus, um, a little bit more of a robust type pig due to the environment that they live in on the, some of the taiga forests of, of Russia. Um, banded pigs, which I mentioned in that early domestication uh, from India and Southeast Asia. Uh, warthogs, were not, which are not a true uh, uh, sua family pig, uh, but they're very closely related to other Sioux species. Um, Havelina, which are actually not related to pigs at all. They are a Teosuidae species, but show some of the same characteristics that we're talking about when we start uh, describing the differences between domestic and wild pigs. 
Uh, bearded pigs of some of the uh, islands of Southeast Asia. Uh, once again, bearded pigs and warty pigs were kind of those first pigs that were domesticated and started spreading down to New Guinea. Uh, Formosan pigs, another uh, Southeast Asia species. Um, this one actually happens to be a, a, a critically endangered species um, just because they're only found on a few islands. But once again, still display characteristics that we will get into here in a little bit. Uh, Red River pigs of the Africa kind of continent, if you will, um, uh, a separate uh, family within the genus of pigs, um, have a little bit of a different look to them. But when we start talking about the characteristics, especially around the head and body, you'll notice that these pigs uh, match up very nicely as well. Bush pigs, very closely related to the Red River pigs, uh, similar habitat. Um, but once again, show those same characteristics when we start trying to differentiate between domestics, feral, and wild pigs. Uh, the Vizayan pigs, I like to call them the punk rockers of the pig world. Uh, they have such a, a cool hairdo, if you will. Um, very closely related to the, the warty pigs as well. Um, actually, when they get older, they will have similar warts on their face that the warty pigs do as well. Uh, here's the warty pigs that I previously mentioned. You'll notice those kind of, in the upper right-hand corner, those large kind of warts, if you will, that develop on the older age class of pigs. And the smallest wild pig that we have out there, referred to as the, the pygmy hog, once again, is a little bit of a different uh, family, but still displays characteristics that we talk about when differentiating from uh, domestics, if you will. So that's kind of our, our wild cousins, if you will, of the, the current day domestic population of pigs. Um, it's important to note that, that pigs were not native to the near Arctic realm, and that's referring to North America primarily in Greenland. Um, pigs were not native to this uh, country of Canada or the United States. Um, all populations are thus the results of direct introductions by man. Um, the earliest pigs brought to the United States were likely from uh, introductions by Christopher Columbus into Cuba in as early as 1493. Um, Spanish explorers, um, including Cortez and De Soto, provisioned themselves with these early uh, feral pigs that uh, Christopher Columbus introduced into Cuba and brought them to the New World around 1500. It's from these stocks that the first well-documented populations uh, or originated in the United States. Um, escaped domestics have reverted in, in several locations and furthered the uh, spread of feral pigs. The first pure wild boar were brought to the United States in about the 1800s. Um, and in all but a few cases, wild boar were initially introduced in areas that contained previously established feral pig populations. In almost every case, pigs escaped or they were intentionally released. Hybridization between the, the wild pigs and those feral pigs um, um, started to occur. Um, all populations thus have been hybridized to some extent. Uh, it, it's rare that you will find a pure strain of wild pig in the United States. And it's my understanding from talking to Marnie and some other folks in Canada that Wild boar were initially brought in for expansion and diversification of a specialized livestock industry, and that escapes occurred and later hunt farms were established and there are still some of those hunt farms uh, today as I understand it. So that's kind of the, the background on domestication and introduction of, of pigs and it, it was very quick on that. Um, so if you have any questions, like I said, please jump in with those. Um, those domestic pigs um, that we've developed, multiple species, or uh, sorry, uh, breeds over time, if you will, um, humans have selected very specific traits that we've bred and refined over time in those pigs. <clears throat> Some of those traits are what we're going to use and what we're going to talk about today that you can use to differentiate between wild and feral pigs. For example, the hams. Um, most of our domestic breeds of pigs they have a very large, well-developed, muscular ham. And we all love that ham for Christmas time or, you know, for special events. Um, so we, we bred for that very specific trait to enlarge those hams in our domestic breeds. 
She's also developed very strong muscular front shoulders. Um, if you're familiar with, uh, you know, the Boston butt, um, it's actually the shoulder of a pig and um, used quite often for, for making pulled pork and things of that nature. Um, those shoulders you'll notice when we get into some photographs are on domestic pigs are very large, which gives them a broad kind of muscular back, if you will. We've also bred for a, a bit of an elongated loin, if you will. That's where the pork chops come from. Um, or uh, uh, tender no, tenderloins on the inside of that, but the uh, the loin, if you will, of a pig. Um, they have the same number of vertebrae as, as wild pigs do, but we've we've bred for that very specific trait to to get that elongated um, loin to give us you know bigger, better pork chops, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. We've also bred domestic breeds of pig to have a. a to them and a long body and we've done that over time uh, that's where the so we bred for that specific trait when you look at domestic pigs and you notice those traits and then compared to wild pigs or feral pigs that have been living wild you'll notice they start going through a bit of change over time and real quickly, I just throw, th throw these photographs up for comparison. Um, the pig in the upper left-hand corner is a domestic breed of pig. You'll notice those characteristics that I'm talking about. Relatively long, deep bodies for that bacon. A long loin across the top. Very large, robust hams. And very beefy front shoulders on those pigs. If you compare that to the feral pig in the upper right-hand corner, You'll notice the, the body structure doesn't seem to be nearly as long. Um, they, they don't have as quite a beefy front shoulder to them. And you will see in some later photographs that that front shoulder actually tends to slope away from the backbone instead of being broad and flat and then rounding off to those shoulders. Um, wild pigs uh, illustrated in the lower left-hand corner, very similar characteristics, shorter coupled body, not as beefy hams on them. Uh, narrower shoulders on the front end. And in the lower right hand corner, I have a, a hybrid between feral and wild pigs. And you'll notice those same characteristics in those. <clears throat> and bear with me, I've got a little bit of a cough, so I got to get a drink every once in a while. So the purpose of this class today is how can we distinguish? Um, we're going to look at those morphological characteristics. It'll help us uh, differentiate domestic breeds versus wild and feral and hybrids as well. We can also talk about DNA. And I know you're asking yourself, but wait, I thought you said we couldn't distinguish by chromosome number alone. Well, that's true. Pigs can have 36, 37, or 38 chromosomes. However, and, and I'll get into this in a little more detail later on in the presentation, we, we can use a process called principal coordinate analysis to start determining origin of pigs and help us determine where they came from. That requires collecting blood samples and tissue and building a database over time so that you have this comparative analysis that you can do. So if you have an unknown pig out there and you can get a sample of blood or tissue and you started building a database, uh, it's in the, in the United States, we have a, a very good database that our United States Department of Agriculture has put together, we can compare that unknown pig to those known populations and start making some pretty good educated guesses on how much wild blood, if you will, for example, that pig has and where, uh, based on those sample populations, that pig may have come from. Um, I wanted to show a picture real quick of two books that I, I utilize as reference material. I'm not, not just making this up. Uh, most of the information I'm providing you today came from these two books, Wild Pigs in the United States by John Mayer and uh, Larry Brisbane Jr. and this Domestication, the Decline of Environmental Appreciation by um, Helmut Hammer. Hammer. Um, valuable uh, resource, especially the one on the left, the wild pigs in the United States has a lot of great detail in there in reference to pigs and where they came from and their everything from their, their history of introduction um, 
to where we are well up into the 1990s when this book was produced anyway. So with that said, let's jump into these morphotypes and start talking about how we can differentiate between the two. So when I say morphotypes, I'm referring to a true wild species of pigs, wild boar. I'm also referring to feral pigs that I'll dub long-term feral and short-term feral. And the only difference there is a short-term feral has been in the wild, obviously for a shorter amount of time than these longer-term pigs that have developed a little more characteristics than the short-term. We'll also talk about hybrids to some degree and uh, the differences between hybrid pigs feral, wild, and our domestics that we've talked about as well. So what happens is in essence, you can take a domestic pig and release it into the wild. And if that pig survives over time and starts to breed, they go through this process we, we call reversion. Reversion by definition is a return to a previous state, practice, or belief. And in biology, we specifically refer to the action of reverting to a former or an ancestral type. Um, so you can see in the photographs there, you could take a domestic pig. That pig is not going to change his physical or morphological appearance, but subsequent generations of that pig breeding in the wild will change to that some of these wild kind of ancestral traits. So what's occurring is, you know, we've specific, specifically bred those domestic pigs to have those, those, what I call human bred traits, those large hams, those big shoulders, long loins, deep sides. And when they start reverting, some of those characteristics start to disappear over time. And that, that phenotypic appearance starts shifting towards what we'll call ancestral traits more of the, the wild pig appearance, if you, if you will. This occurs primarily by natural selection and adaptation. Um, those pigs surviving in the wild, certain characteristics uh, lend themselves to long, longer term survival versus our domestic pigs that are very reliant on humans, you know, for, for feed and whatnot. It takes approximately three generations to complete this reversion process. Pigs have a very high reproductive capacity. They can breed at three to six months of age. They can produce a litter up to three times per year. And their gestation period is only about 100 to 140 days long. It varies amongst different uh, breeds and species. Litter size can be as large as 14 piglets, but the average is about six pigs. So you can see that they have a, a very high reproductive capacity. They can breed at a young age. They can breed up to three times per year. They can have a relatively large litter size. So this reversion process going through three generations can happen relatively quickly. And populations can double within one year. So as I said on the previous slide, those human bred traits start to fade over time. And in the, the two photographs on the right hand side, you have a domestic pig on the left and a feral pig on the right. And you should start noticing from these photographs some, some very distinct differences when we're looking at the head of the domestic pig versus a feral pig on the right hand side. That's just one of the characteristics we're going to uh, focus on. So those ancestral traits start to reappear. One of those traits that we, we look at to try to differentiate is referred to as a shallower dorsal profile. And I'll put up a, a slide here in a little bit to explain that. Uh, but basically, it's if you look at the shape of a pig's head in profile, from, so from the side, and you laid a ruler from the between its ears down to the tip of its snout, you'll see a natural gap um, underneath that ruler. That, that depth of that gap is referred to as the, the dorsal profile. And in wild and feral pigs, that dorsal profile is much shallower than it is on our domestic friends. 
You'll also notice an increased condylar basal length. Uh, and once again, I'll, I'll put up an illustration that shows this. That increased length is primarily in the rostrum or the nose. And you can see that in these two photographs as well. I briefly mentioned this before, there's, there's a shorter body length head and body combined, or at least the appearance of a, a shorter body when compared to domestic breeds. There's a narrower width of the skull. If you look at a pig straight on, you'll notice that domestic pigs typically have a broader skull and wild and feral pigs have a more narrow skull. Typically, wild and feral pigs have longer tusks, especially the, the males. Um, that's because domestic breeds, most often when they're young piglets, the, the pig farmer literally nips those teeth. He uses a pair of cutters to cut those tusks off. They're very sharp. They're like razors and young piglets. Well, obviously in wild and feral pigs, that doesn't occur and those tusks continue to grow over time. And I'll, I'll get into more detail on the tusk as well. That narrowing of the back that I mentioned, like I said, we've bred our domestic pigs to have very broad, flat kind of backs for big shoulders and long loins. The wild and feral pigs, you'll notice that that starts to narrow up and forms more of a, an inverted V, if you will, and it slopes from their spinal column down towards their shoulder. They generally have smaller hams. Once again, we bred that specific trait for to have large hams. As they go through this reversion process, you'll notice that those rear hams aren't nar nearly as large as the domestic animals, if you will. Wild and feral pigs tend to have coarser hair and longer length, and they can possibly have this woolly underfur beneath those uh, long kind of guard hairs. And then any sort of hybridization with wild pigs can start changing that phenotypic appearance even further. So if you took domestic pigs, put them in the wild, and over three generations, they start reverting to this more ancestral traits, and then you introduce wild pigs and you get crossbreeding between those two, it can actually kind of speed that process up and change that phenotypic appearance. So how do we differentiate? Um, it's important to remember that you must use the totality of the circumstances to make a determination. One characteristic in and of itself is not definitive. It's complicated due to crossbreeding and hybridization. Some characteristics are more indicative than others. For example, head and skulls and the coloration and hair are a lot more indicative than body length as an example. Um, it's also important for you guys to know that it's much easier to differentiate in older age classes versus younger age classes. <clears throat> the younger the pig is, the, the more difficult it is to, de to determine. So I'm going to go through those that list, if you will, that I showed here. Shallower dorsal profile, increased condylobasal length. Shorter head body lengths, narrow with the skull, longer tusk, narrowing of the back, smaller hams, and coarser hair. And the first one we're going to talk about is this uh, body length, the head to the base of tail, if you will. In this slide, the two pigs on the left-hand side are feral pigs. The two pigs on the right-hand side are domestic breeds of pigs. Um, these are roughly the same age class of pigs and roughly about the same weight so that we can make a a true comparison, if you will. You'll notice on the body length on the pig in the upper left hand side, excuse me, if you just look at that length from the base of the tail to the head, this pig appears to be a lot shorter coupling is what I would refer to it versus the domestic pig on the right when you go from the base of the tail to the base of the head as well. Um, domestic breeds, once again, we've bred for that long loin, just appear to be a lot longer in their body than feral pigs or wild pigs. Um, the two on the bottom, uh, same story. We've got the feral pig on the left. They're slightly quartering to us, but you can still tell if you're looking at that, that body length, this pig just appears to be a lot shorter in body length than that domestic pig that's quartering to us as well. So if, we, if you can imagine looking at a pig out in the field or a photograph of a pig, 
and drawing an imaginary rectangle on that pig. If you draw that rectangle from the base of the tail to where the head joins the, the body, if you will, and then basically from the ground up to that same line, you'll end up with a rectangle. And you'll notice on domestic pigs that that rectangle appears to be considerably longer than it is tall. Versus on a feral or a hybrid type pig, if I draw that same imaginary rectangle on there, it's still longer in length than it is in height, but that rectangle is considerably shorter than on a domestic pig. <clears throat> Excuse me, on a wild pig, it's exactly the same. If you draw that imaginary line, base of the tail to the base of the head, ground up to that body, you'll notice that rectangle appears to be a lot shorter than on our domestic breeds. And after you get to looking at a lot of pigs, this becomes relatively easy over time. So for side-by-side -side comparison, we've got our wild pig on the left, we've got our domestic pig on the right. Once again, you can see that that rectangle on a domestic pig appears to be a lot longer than it is on the wild pig on the left. So now let's move into a little bit of the characteristics of the head. And I put a, a smattering of photos on this page for comparison. We have domestic pigs on the upper left-hand side and the lower left center there. We have feral pigs uh, center at the top and the bottom right and a wild pig on the upper right-hand side. <clears throat> Uh, remember, one of the characteristics of the head that I mentioned is this longer condylobasal length. When I'm talking about the condylobasal length, the green line in this photograph is what I'm referring to. So basically from the back of the skull, the, where the axis uh, joins the back of the skull, to the tip of the nose is the condylobasal length. Um, so I'm going to jump back one slide. When we're, when we're looking at that condylobasal length, of a domestic pig versus a feral or a wild pig, you'll notice that that condylobasal length is much longer in feral and wild pigs than it is in our domestic friends. And we can see that in the bottom photograph as well with these two domestic pigs. I also mentioned the dorsal profile. Um, so if you can imagine this blue line is a ruler that you laid down the skull of this pig, the yellow line is what we're referring to as that dorsal profile, that depth of dorsal profile. On wild pigs and feral pigs, that dorsal profile is relatively shallow. On domestic pigs, it's much deeper. Once again, I'm going to jump back a slide for comparison, and especially on these domestic pigs in the, the lower photograph, if you can imagine that line drawn down these, the skull of these pigs, and you can see how there's a, a dishing in their face, if you will. That dorsal profile is much deeper than if I did the same thing with this uh, wild boar or with either of these feral pigs. Now, it's important to note on the wild boar, that, that's a tuft of hair, if you will, on the top of its head. Its, its skull is actually about where the base of its ear is. So if you laid a ruler, you would see that that's a relatively shallow dorsal profile. Now, if you come across a skull out in the field, you, you can't really determine this on photographs or looking at a, a live animal, but one other indicator uh, on the head characteristic and the skull specifically is what we refer to as the occipital wall angle. Um, that's simply a, a line drawn horizontal through the skull and a secondary line that follows the base of that skull, the occipital wall. On wild and feral pigs, that occipital wall angle is always greater than 90 degrees. On domestic pigs, that occipital wall angle is generally 90 degrees or less. So if you have a skull that you found in the field, you should be able to determine whether it was domestic, uh, wild, or feral. So for a side-by-side -side comparison, um, in the upper left-hand corner, we have a feral pig skull. In the upper right-hand corner, we have a wild pig skull. In the lower left-hand corner, we have a domestic pig skull. In the lower right-hand corner is actually a breed of domestic pig referred to as a potbelly pig. Um, 
The two on the bottom center, the one on the center left is a domestic pig skull. The one on the center right is a uh, wild pig skull. So thinking about some of those characteristics again, if we're looking at the dorsal profile, we can see on the feral pig, it's relatively shallow. We can see on the wild pig, it's relatively shallow. And we can see that on a domestic pig, it's a little bit deeper on this skull than it is the two above. And on the pot belly pig, it's even more pronounced. You'll have a much deeper dorsal profile on that pig. Um, I mentioned the width of the skull. If we look at the two center photos again, the, the maximum width of that domestic pig skull is a lot wider than it is on a wild or a feral pig skull. And you can see that in the top center photo as well. Wild and feral pigs have a much narrower skull. Um, once again, that condylobasal length much longer in the feral and wild pigs than it is in our domestic or our uh, potbelly pig down there as well. Just another slide that shows a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, a feral pig on the left, domestic pig on the right this time. So if we're looking at the, the width of that skull, domestic pigs appear to have a much wider skull than a feral pig. Um, in the two bottom photographs, you can really see that dishing in the face on this domestic skull. So it will have a much deeper dorsal profile compared to that, that feral pig on the left-hand side. And once again, that length, the condylobasal length is much shorter in domestic and much longer in wild and feral pigs. One more quick photograph to, to drive that point home. And this photograph is a domestic pig skull on the left, a feral pig skull in the middle, and a pot belly pig skull on the right-hand side. Um, you can see the feral pig is much more narrow across the width of the skull than the domestic pig, has a much more elongated rostrum or that condylobasal length that we're talking about. And if we turn these sideways, you would see that that occipital wall angle is past 90 degrees on the feral pig and less than 90 degrees on the domestic and the uh, pot belly pig. So on characteristics of the head, I'll, I'll re-emphasize that adult males give the best intergroup separation. It's much easier to determine on adult males than it is on females and younger pigs. Cranial measurements give superior results versus trying to measure a mandible. So that's why we use the condylobasal length rather than the mandible length. Uh, separation of skulls of long-term versus short-term ferals are the clearest in older age classes. <coughs> Excuse me again. So now let's shift and talk about color or coloration of, of pigs. Um, over time with domestic breeds, we've bred basically every colors of the rainbow. And that's indicative in this slide that you see in front of you. Um, all of the pigs on the left-hand side, the two columns on the left-hand side are feral pigs. All the pigs on the right-hand side are domestic pigs, with the exception of uh, the two wild pigs on the, the lower left of that right-hand side. Um, so you can see that the, the colors run the gamut out there. Um, however, when we start talking about color, and we go back to a photograph of our, our wild pigs, that I showed you several of early on. One thing to note in wild pigs is that there's, there's always or about always this grizzled coloration is what it's referred to. And you'll notice in the face of these two pigs that kind of whitish or off whitish color around the jowls, down the shoulders and the back and over the tops of the ham. Um, this is that grizzled coloration, much like the, the way a grizzly bear gets its name, that grizzled tips of the hair is fairly evident in most of our wild pigs. Hair density. Um, most of our domestic breeds, uh, such as the two on the left-hand side of the screen are domestics, two on the right-hand side are ferals again. Um, you just don't see the hair density or the coarseness or length of hair in domestic pigs that you typically will see in feral pigs that's illustrated on the right-hand side. Um, Wild and feral pigs tend to have a, a predominant ridge of hair that runs down the center of their back. 
that's what the photograph in the upper right hand side is trying to illustrate that that ridge of longer coarser hair runs down the center of their back uh, on the lower right hand side you can see a much denser hair it, it, it's hard to see in this photograph but uh, it, it's a predominant ridge of hair down his back another thing to look at when we're talking about hair density is if you look at the two photographs on the left you notice skin pigmentation showing through where that white and black intersect in his body. And you can see that on both pigs. Because of an increased hair density and sometimes that woolly underfur in wild and feral pigs, you hardly ever see that color transition, that pigmentation on the skin. Now I will caution you that domestic pigs that are raised in a colder climate sometimes can have a little denser hair, but generally, uh, or hair density, I'm referring to the number of hairs per square inch, if you will, on the body. Um, but the hair coarseness and length is about always longer on feral and wild pigs than it is on our domestic pigs as well. <clears throat> I mentioned that predominant ridge of hair along their back. Um, pretty evident in the top two photographs. Um, we have in the upper left what we typically refer to as an Arkansas Razorback pig, a um, uh, feral type, a uh, wild crossed hybrid that's uh, typical of Arkansas in the, in the lower United States, um, and a feral pig on the upper right hand side. Um, they have the ability, due to that, that underlying muscle tissue of the skin, to, to raise that hair up and make it stand on end. And when they're agitated and aggravated, they will kind of rough that, that predominant ridge of hair up along their back. If we compare that to the domestic pigs in the lower photograph, you'll notice a relatively short hair, uh, much lower hair density compared to the two in the upper photographs. <clears throat> so let's talk about the tusk a little bit more in detail. <clears throat> when I'm when I'm referring to tusk, pigs, the tusk is the tooth that erupts from the lower jaw. And you can see that in the upper left-hand side um, and as well in the pig photographs on the lower left and lower right and on our skull in the middle. So the lower tooth is the tusk. The upper tooth is referred to as the wetter. And you can see that in the upper right-hand photo. It's, it's a similar tooth, if you will, but the purpose of that wetter is to keep that lower tooth sharp. Kind of zoom in on that same photograph. You can see the tusk in the bottom jaw, the wetter tooth on the top. You can see that in this uh, pig in the photograph on the right as well. So this will be the tusk in the lower jaw, the wetter in the upper jaw. That wetter rubs against that lower tooth and keeps it extremely sharp. That inner and outer edge of that tusk can be like a razor. And if they haven't broke that tip off, and you can see in this photograph, they can be extremely sharp on the point of that tip as well. Tusks are more predominant in males than females, um, and it's a, a fighting and defense uh, mechanism that they use. Um, so when we're talking about the tusk, like I said, in wild and feral pigs, you about always see in the males that eruption of that tusk um, versus our domestic friends when we've nipped that tooth off when they were piglets. Speaking of piglets, uh, it's a great segue into the next slide. Um, the morphological characteristics are less distinguished or less distinguishable in younger age classes. <clears throat> in the photograph on the upper right hand side, we have some wild pigs feral pigs on the upper left. As pigs age, morphological characteristics become more noticeable. One good indication is the stripe coloration of wild piglets. That happens to be an ancestral trait. All wild pig populations have striped piglets. Dem or excuse me, feral pigs, as we can see on the upper left, you might see some faint striping in some of those pigs and they lose this stripe color as a, as a uh, age. Um, but there's always an exception. And I remember I told you about the totality of the circumstances. Don't use stripe coloration in and of itself. You have to look at everything. 
<clears throat> Feral pigs such as these in this photograph may not display that stripe coloration you notice in the piglets on the bottom. And I'd also like to point out that, as I said before, differentiation of the younger age classes is more difficult. If you look at the piglets in this photograph and you start thinking about condyla basal length and dorsal profile and body length and hair density, it's much less evident in these young pigs. But in these kind of teenagers, you start to see some of those characteristics uh, appear. And in the much older age classes, they're, they're much more evident. So here's some pigs down in Texas. Um, these happen to be kind of wild, feral, hybrid type pigs. Uh, most often somebody would probably just refer to them as feral pigs, but you'll notice the piglet right dead center of the road there has that stripe coloration. That's a great indicator that there's likely some sort of wild blood mixed with this population. All of the other little piglets show some, you know, polka dot and different colors, but do not show that stripe coloration. <clears throat> These are wild pigs. And as I said, all wild pigs, most uh, their piglets always have this kind of stripe coloration to them. Um, different species show different striping patterns, if you will, but still show that stripe coloration. True Russian boar, you always see the striped piglets in there. And as they start aging, those, those stripes start fading over time. But that stripe coloration is an ancestral trait. Uh, it's another pig that actually showed up uh, downtown Glenwood Springs, Colorado. We have no idea where it came from, but shows that stripe coloration and hair density as well. <clears throat> As I said, when the pigs start to, to age, that striping color starts to disappear and they'll become more the color depending on the, the lineage of their parents, if you will, or some sort of cross between those two. And remember, I always said there's an exception to the rule. With that stripe coloration, this is a domestic pe uh, breed of pig that their piglets always have that stripe coloration showing up in them. It's much more faded uh, as young pigs, and it disappears relatively quick. This is the same litter of pigs on the left, on the right. Um, and within a matter of a couple of weeks, that stripe coloration starts to fade over time. So these are referred to as Mangalitsa or Mangalika pigs, uh, sometimes referred to as woolly pigs. But this is, a, this is a domestic breed of pig that shows that stripe coloration. So remember, totality of circumstances. Just a photograph of the, the same breed of pigs. Um, they all look like they've had a, a perm or they, they, I think Marnie said it looked like they were sheep. So, uh, you know, they have that curly hair. So that stripe coloration disappears really early in time and they start developing this kind of curly woolly hair, thus the name woolly pigs. So is there any difference between wild or feral pigs that are raised in captivity versus those that are running wild or wild run type pigs? In this slide, I tried to illustrate uh, very similar looking pigs that were pin raised on the two photographs on the left and wild run pigs on the right. So thinking about those uh, characteristics of the, the head, the tusk, the hair density, the body shape, if you compare these two pigs, there's very little difference amongst them. You'll still notice that long condylobasal length. You can see tusks starting to show up in this pig in the upper left. You can see the long condylobasal length on the pig and the wild run pig on the right. And on the lower left are, are two hybrid uh, wild feral pigs and then a feral pig in the middle. You can start seeing that grizzled coloration in that hair, which should be an indicator as well. This is a game trail camera of a, a wild run feral pig, if you will. Once again, displays those same characteristics that we look for. Uh, a relatively long condylobasal length. We can see tusk, this pig. Short cut body. Our rectangle on here, it's, it's not quite as long on our domestic breeds. And relatively long hair. I, I will point out that pigs do a lot of rubbing, and this pig has kind of rubbed the hair off of his shoulder. Um, 
male pigs fight standing kind of head to head and side by side. And they, they throw these tusks into this shoulder region, if you will. And over time, male pigs develop a, a very thick, gristly plate over this shoulder. So it's very hard and dense. Another wild feral pig, a little younger age class, but once again, shows the same characteristics that we're talking about. Now, this one's looking at us, so it's a little more difficult to, to determine condylobasal length, but you can see it's relatively narrow across the skull, relatively short coupled body, long, dense hair. If we drew our rectangle again, it looks like more of a square in this pig. One thing I'll point out that I haven't on the others is if you look at the ears of a pig, because of the longer, denser hair, feral and wild pigs, their, their ear always seems to have a little fringe on it. And just it's, it's more hair around the ear compared to our domestic breeds. And I'll also point out the, the tails real quick. If I went back through some of these photographs, you'll notice that, um, well, apparently I don't have any. Uh, you'll notice that on feral pigs and wild pigs, they tend to carry their tail more straight. It's not that curly, you know, uh, porky pig tail that we envision on domestic pigs. Um, so pay attention as we go through these slides and look at that tail. <coughs> You'll notice that it, it generally carried in a more straight manner. This is a game trail uh, picture from Canada. Uh, Perry, and I just went brain dead on his name, Am Ambrook, is that right? Um, shared these photographs with me, but this is a Canadian pig that was uh, captured, I believe. Uh, but the same thing applies. We start looking at those characteristics. Relatively long condylobasal length. We can see the thick, woolly hair and density on this pig. You can see the predominant ridge of hair along its back. Uh, much smaller hams and uh, more robust kind of front shoulders on them. They're not quite as deep and long through the body. Uh, if I go back to the previous photo, I, I also failed to mention, if you look at the rump of a wild and feral pig, you almost always see this sloping away. Um, and that's because the, the pelvis is more evident because they don't have that big, robust ham that we've bred in our domestic breeds. Uh, same thing on that photograph. You can see that, that sloping away in the hind quarters. That's less evident in our domestics, but you can see that once again in this uh, photograph of the Canadian pig as well. Okay, so I also mentioned a, uh, a technique referred to as principal coordinate analysis um, for trying to help distinguish between pigs and different populations of pigs especially. Uh, PCA is, is a visualized geometric relationship between different populations. Um, I apologize for these photographs. I was at an obtuse angle when I took them. But basically, doing this PCA technique, you create clusters or populations of pigs over time by sampling. And you can start seeing when you start getting interbreeding and some crossing between different populations of pigs. Uh, we've done this in the lower United States, and this photograph kind of shows different clusters or populations of pigs. You'll notice down in Florida, it's a different color. It's a different base population of pigs that were introduced by the, the Spanish explorers primarily. All across the southeast United States, you see a relatively closely related pig population, but there's been a lot of interbreeding amongst those. And then you can see some isolated pockets of different colors. Um, that represent uh, likely kind of more wild type pigs that were introduced in, onto the landscape. This is a, a quick picture that shows some pigs that were tested in Germany. And once again, you can, you can see those clusters start forming nicely using this technique. And, and once again, where they kind of start interbreeding and mixing. So what is uh, principal coordinate analysis? It's a genotype that, that's used to analyze microsatellite loci on very specific alleles within the, the chromosome or that DNA strand. By taking blood and tissue samples, you can start uh, doing this comparative analysis. Um, and like I said, we built this database of different pig breeds, uh, domestic breeds, 
wild and feral, and we can start comparing them um, to others over time. This photograph is actually showing, if you look at the, the top line under V1, 4, 6, 5, 7, 8, this was the last pig killed in Colorado, and we were comparing this pig to other known samples in Colorado. If you follow across the chart to the right and you look at the highlighted sections, this gives you a percentage, if you will, of the blood within that particular pig. This particular pig showed about 39% of a Western heritage, so a domestic type breed, and approximately, sorry, I lost my cursor, about 42.5% of European wild boar. When we compare that to the other known samples, it seems to be um, an outlier. So when we chart that on kind of a scattergram, if you will, the red arrow indicates that last known pig, which was killed down in Baca County, Colorado. You can see we compared it to samples from Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, and New Mexico. And that pig does not fit with our Colorado pigs that we typically sample down there. So if I zoom in on that a little bit, kind of separate those clusters, you'll notice the, the blue circle, that Colorado pig very closely associates with these kind of clear triangles. And you can see from our legend up there that that's from Hutchinson County, Texas. Um, the diamonds are our typical Southeast Colorado pigs. So we know from sampling that pig that that we had eradicated this population and that is not where this pig came from. He actually came from Hutchinson County, Texas, following natural kind of riparian areas and immigrated into Southeast Colorado. Uh, just so happened to be in that same location where we had eradicated these other pigs. <clears throat> you can also use um, eDNA, environmental DNA, for detecting the presence of pigs. As various organisms interact with the environment, DNA is expelled and accumulates in their surroundings. That's in fe uh, feces, mucus, gametes, shed scan, carcasses, and hair. It can be collected from a variety of environmental samples, such as soil, water, snow, or even the air, rather than directly sampling from an individual organism. Samples can be analyzed uh, by high throughput DNA sequencing methods for rapid measurement and monitoring of biodiversity. Uh, DNA metabarcoding is used in which the sample is analyzed and uses uh, previously studied DNA libraries to determine what organisms are present. Um, they've actually used this to determine uh, the presence or absence of uh, some threatened endangered species as well. Um, so the analysis of eDNA has great potential, not only for monitoring common species, but to genetically detect and identify other extant species that could influence conservation efforts, uh, such as wild or feral pigs. <clears throat> so I briefly wanted to mention that. So um, I'm going through this pretty quick, but let's talk a little bit about damage identification. Um, this photograph shows a, a green cornfield. Um, and one thing that I'll, I'll point out in this photograph, besides the obvious, a bunch of corn has been kind of mowed down, if you look closely at the stalks on these corn, uh, corn plants, you'll notice that almost every one of them have kind of been broke over at an angle. Um, this is caused by pigs and pigs don't have the ability to reach very far up the plant to those ears of corn. So they literally grasp the stalk in their mouth and they break it over in order to access that standing corn. So that's pretty indicative of pig damage. Uh, you won't see that with deer. They typically either eat the whole plant or they just eat the, the cobs right off of the stock. You won't see that with raccoons as an example that just climb the stock and, and eat the ears or break them off. But when you see these broke over stocks, it's pretty indicative of, of pigs causing part of the damage. There's a similar cornfield. Um, once again, if you look closely, you start noticing that uh, the stalks are kind of broke over, um, which is pretty indicative of pigs um, causing some of this damage. You could also look for scats, uh, scat and tracks and things of that nature. Uh, the information at the bottom is a little out of date. It says that uh, crop damage and control cost about $300 per feral pig. That's a little dated and that cost certainly has gone up. 
if you walked out the front door of your house uh, tomorrow morning and this is what you saw, uh, you should have a pretty good indication. Um, this is the rooting behavior that, that pigs tend to do. Um, in this particular case, in a kind of a residential area with their lawns, likely they had somewhat of a grub problem in their lawn. And these pigs moved in overnight and just literally rooted up their lawn, digging those grubs out of the ground and eating those grubs. If you play golf, uh, this would be a terrible sight to see once you got on the second or third hole. You can see the, the amount of resource damage that pigs can cause in a relatively short time, such as the rooting behavior again on this, uh, this green on a golf course. Um, here's a few pictures that, that Perry uh, uh, provided me from Al Alberta Agriculture. This was an oat field that feral pigs or wild pigs had got into and caused some damage in these oats. Um, I don't know much about oat fields. Uh, we don't grow a lot of oats in my part of the country, but you can see how the oats have been trampled. Um, and no doubt the pigs are you know, eating the oats off the top of those. This is a drone in that's that same field. And you can see the amount of damage in that oat field that, that pigs can cause over time. You'll note the, the trails where they're walking from one spot to another and the, the big damage areas that you'll notice in the field as well. This was damage in a, a Canadian hay crop. Um, same sort of rooting behavior that we saw in the lawns and on the golf course can cause uh, extensive damage and uh, loss of production on, in you know different agricultural crops as well. Um, de depending on the type of hay field, obviously if this was alfalfa or something of that nature, very expensive to replant. So it was a, a huge economic impact. Another oat crop um, on the edge, you can see it looks like somebody basically just took a rototiller and, and churned up the, the soil around this oat crop out here. Um, this is actually how I confirmed the presence of feral pigs um, all the way back in 2000 um, in southeast Colorado along the, uh, the borrow pit or the bar ditch, if you will, of a road. This is exactly what it looked. Uh, overnight, the pigs had really just rooted it up. So let's talk about tracks a little bit. Um, pig tracks are fairly distinctive. Um, and in this photograph of a pig's foot, you'll notice the toe of the, the pig is really rounded off versus kind of sharp and pointy like you might find in deer, for example. I'll also point out the, the dew claws on pigs tend to be a little lower on the leg than it is on some of our ungulate species. So when you have a track from a pig, you'll about always see this, this dew claw mark and that more rounded off toe. And the reason that is, is uh, jump back to this photograph, pigs tend to walk a little more up on their toes versus just on the pad of their foot, if you will. Um, and it wears that, that front toe over time and causes it to be a little more rounded. Now, remember I said the older age classes are easier to distinguish. That's the same with, with tracks as well. Young newborn pigs have a relatively sharp toe and it's not rounded off yet. But in comparison to this deer track, you can kind of see the differences. The dew claw is about always splayed outside of the margins of the pad, where with deer, it's usually you know behind the, the pad directly, unless that deer is running and really plants his foot hard. Um, here's a photograph of a feral pig track in some relatively soft sand. Um, but if you look closely, you can, you can see those distinguishing characteristics that kind of rounded off toe deep in the track. You can see the dew claws outside the margins of that track as well. Here's another pig track in some mud. And even though it kind of squished back in with mud, you can still see the rounded toe. You can still see those very evident dew claw marks outside the margins of the pad. Here's another pig track and a little firmer, uh, rockier type soil. And we can definitely see the, the rounded toe marks in this track. And if you look extremely close down on that lower left hand side, you can actually see just the impression of a dew claw mark. Um, so on harder soil, it's a little more difficult to determine. On softer soil, a little easier. 
once again, uh, it's kind of some sandy uh, habitat, if you will, that these pigs walk through. But if you look at every one of these tracks up close, you would notice that they have that rounded toe. You can see clearly the dew claw marks outside of the margin of that foot on every one of these tracks as they move through this sandy substrate. So trying to differentiate from scat is extremely difficult. And the reason that is, is pig diets are, are so varied. They will basically eat anything is the way I would describe it. And the, the quality of that scat sample can be, I mean, everything from runny to solid to clumps to elongated, uh, you know, sections of that. Um, but if you have track association with scat, that should kind of start giving you a clue. And it is possible to pull eDNA e from scat samples as well. So scat is, is not a very useful tool just because it is so varied in composition. Wallows, on the other hand, are a very good indicator that you have pigs in the area. Um, you can see in this photograph, you can, you can find a pig wallow from a long distance off. Um, much like an elk wallow, they will uh, get down and, and roll in there. Um, pig wallows have a very distinctive odor. If you've ever been around pigs, um, you won't miss that smell. You, you, can, you can identify it once you've been there. Um, cause an awful lot of habitat destruction. You can see that, that wallowing and kind of rooting behavior. Um, pigs wallow in order to keep themselves cool and to help control parasites. Um, pigs cannot sweat like you and I. So in order to, to lower their body temperature, especially in warm weather, uh, they're reliant on water and wallowing in order to, to lower their body temperature. <clears throat> they will also roll in that mud. Um, and then as that mud starts drying, they will rub against trees and posts in order to try to remove parasites that are causing them to itch. A couple more photographs of wallows. Uh, once again, uh, very distinctive. Uh, once you get around one and that odor and that smell, you can't miss it. Um, the lower right hand photo, you know, might be mistaken for like an elk wallow, but once again, very different odor with an elk wallow than it is with a pig wallow. And once again, look for the presence of tracks and other indicators. Um, in that upper left photo, you'll notice on the trees, a lot of mud smeared on the trees. That's that rubbing behavior that pigs tend to do. Speaking of rubs, they, they will rub on basically any vertical item out there. Um, be it a telephone pole in the lower right hand photo, fence posts in the upper left, uh, or any sort of native trees that are out there. Um, usually you'll see mud caked on those trees or posts because they've been wallowing and then rubbing on that. Uh, they can use it as somewhat of a scent marker, but it's generally, like I said, uh, more of a scratching post than anything else. Um, if you look closely on trees that pigs have been rubbing on, you'll also usually see some hair, especially on a, a tree with rough bark, such as this one, um, and in the upper right-hand photo as well. Um, usually that mud is on the lower part of the post um, versus on, you know, cattle or some other species rubbing is usually higher up on the post than lower on that post. So uh, anytime you see that mud and rubs on trees, it's a pretty good indicator that you've got pigs in the area. And the lower left-hand photo, if you look closely, you can also see some rooting behavior in the background as well. I always encourage everybody to pay attention to fence lines, especially if there's barb or twisted wire of some sort. Um, pigs like to go underneath the wire. They generally don't go through the strands. Uh, they'll put their head underneath the wire and lift it and push their way underneath the fence. Um, on barbed wire especially, you can see in this photograph, it tends to snag hair, great source uh, for trying to identify. Once again, if you look closely at these hairs, they're very long, dense, coarse hair. It's not easily mistaken uh, with other species once you've got, once you've looked at it and, and really understand what pig hair looks like. Um, I'd also encourage you to look at the bottom side of the wire. If they've been rubbing and, and wallowing and they go underneath the fence, quite often you'll see caked mud where it's been rubbed off on that wire as well. 
So pay attention to your fence lines out there. So what sort of impacts uh, do wild and feral pigs cause? Well, they transmit a multitude of diseases, um, both from pig populations to livestock, pig populations to domestic and wild animals, uh, and can transmit disease to humans as well. There's direct competition for resources out there. There's obviously the habitat loss and destruction that they cause. And there's predation. Uh, pigs have been known to, to depredate uh, everything from bird's nests to lizards to snakes to deer fawns to baby lambs, you name it. There's obviously an agricultural impact, uh, both to livestock and crops growing out there. And in this photograph, you can actually see some wild pigs carrying a fawn in its mouth. Um, as I said, that, that predation, um, direct predation, can certainly have an impact. Um, it's unusual to have pigs directly attack livestock, especially you know larger adult livestock, but they can prey on maybe lambs, um, that sort of thing. In this photograph, you actually see a, a bunch of turkey vultures and a feral pig eating a dead cow carcass. Um, this was a, another indicator that I came across in Southeast Colorado when we first discovered feral pigs out there. The farmer had a dead cow laying out in the pasture. When I came by the next day, that dead cow was actually moving. The sides of that cow were heaving up and down. And when I watched through binoculars, I was able to finally see a, a pig's head come up over the top of that carcass where he was eating the entrails of that dead cow. Um, so once again, they, they certainly can have an impact to livestock. In this photograph, you see where one actually captured a, a, a lamb and killed the lamb and was eating the lamb. <coughs> Excuse me. In this photograph, there's a feral pig uh, captured on a game trail camera depredating a turkey nest, um, eating the eggs out of that turkey nest. Um, they will eat the, the hen if they can catch her on the nest or any sort of gallinaceous bird that's you know, ground nesting type birds uh, certainly have an impact on. I've seen feral pigs eat lizards, um, rattlesnakes, uh, you name it. Um, any sort of dead carcass out there, they'll help on. And obviously they can have a direct impact to us as humans as well. They're very dangerous animals. Um, if cornered or threatened, uh, they will not hesitate to attack. Um, I've actually been ran over by feral pigs, but never seriously injured. Um, they, they can cause, uh, potentially cause death though with the tusk and whatnot. So be very careful out there in the field as well. So what do you do about it? Uh, you've got to get ahead of that problem. Um, and this is just kind of my advice I'm throwing out there for the group. Um, start by educating the public, you know, let people know the impact that these things can have. Um, start engaging your landowners. Um, Landowners need to be aware of the potential impacts to their, their livestock, their agricultural operation, their pets, their family, you name it. Um, start building relationships um, you know, with different entities, with different uh, landowner groups, the public, um, and start developing some sort of a cooperative type effort to address this. I, I can tell you because I was the, the lone soldier early on in Colorado's fight against feral pigs, that doing it by yourself does not accomplish much. Uh, we killed a lot of pigs, but we certainly were not having any sort of an impact until I was able to get the Colorado Department of Agriculture and the United States Department of Agriculture on board. And we, we formed a cooperative effort and started addressing the issue. Um, you know, reach out to your agency's uh, field staff for assistance. Um, Show them this slide presentation, you know, tell them what to look for and, and help be the eyes and ears out there to, you know, to try to track these things down. Um, if it requires some fix legislatively or regulatory, I, I encourage folks to, to pursue that. Um, we had that problem in Colorado where feral pigs fell somewhere in limbo between domestic and wildlife. Um, so we had to pursue regulatory fixes with both the Department of Agriculture and Colorado Parks and Wildlife in order to start addressing that problem. But if you can do that up front, uh, identify what the problems are, 
try to get those fixed up front. It'll it'll make your fight easier. And then you just have to have this kind of dogged, persistent approach. It takes time. Um, Colorado had feral pigs sporadically in the, the 80s and 90s, but very small populations that quickly disappeared until around 2000 when they really started taking hold in Colorado. It was a 20-year effort to eradicate pigs from the state of Colorado. I started that fight in 2000, and we finally accomplished that in 2020. And use every tool in the toolbox. You know, look at the new technology and the science that's out there that can help, um, you know, address that pig problem, whether that's building a database and mapping, doing eDNA or some of the new um, equipment that I'll show a couple of photographs here in a minute. And also it takes time and funding, as I mentioned. Um, we didn't have much of a fund. Uh, luckily, USDA was able to kick in some funding to help us address our problems in Colorado. This is just a quick slide to show that partnership. Uh, we called it Colorado's Feral Pig Task Force. Like I said, it took 20 years of work, uh, but it included the U.S. Department of Agriculture, our Forest Service uh, Department, United States Department of Agriculture, Colorado Department of Agriculture, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, just real quickly, some slides or photographs showing some of the tools that we utilized in Colorado in our campaign to, to get rid of pigs. Um, we used helicopters, um, wildlife officers out on the ground, our biologists on the ground helping us out, trapping techniques. You can see in a couple of these photographs, um, game trail cameras. Uh, we did sample water holes and whatnot for eDNA, and that helped us detect some of the pig populations. Um, uh, wildlife officers, that's myself in the center photograph there, was the last three pigs we killed in one population. Um, and you can see in this top photograph with the pickup involved just how large the, these feral pigs were. Um, in that lower center photograph, this is actually a horse trailer full of feral pigs that we stopped, our law enforcement officers stopped, illegally transporting uh, pigs into Colorado. So once again, you got to use all of those tools um, uh, in order to start addressing those problems. Uh, speaking of tools, just a couple of quick photographs I wanted to go through. These are some automated type traps that are out there on the market. Um, this one actually has an outer ring and an inner ring. It uses a game trail camera um, or a um, uh, active camera that you can uh, watch from your cell phone, if you will. You pre-bait it, get pigs used to coming in here. Once you have the whole sounder of pigs within that trap, it can be remotely detonated and this outer ring drops down and you've captured that, that whole bunch of pigs. Um, some other kind of new technology that's out there. Um, I, I mentioned uh, uh, active cameras, you know, that are live cameras that you can observe. These tie into your cell phone. So, with the, you know, from the luxury of your, your couch, you can watch what's going on with your traps and trigger them remotely if needed. These have a battery pack, a solar system to keep them charged. This hog eye camera. Uh, provides a, a great view. It also has night vision, um, uses infrared, um, has an antenna for uh, transporting or putting that image out there to your cell phone as well. On the left-hand side was uh, probably one of the coolest pieces of technology I've seen in a while. This is actually a computer-operated feeder. It has these electronic eyes, one on each side, so four electronic eyes and an internal computer, once again, a battery system, a solar charger, the computer using these electronic eyes can differentiate between pigs. And in this picture, you'll notice he's holding a picture of a feral pig in front of the, the eye. That computer can recognize that as a pig and open these kind of rectangular feeders down there. And inside of that feeder, they actually have a, a it's an experimental uh, poison bait that uh, once a pig eats it, reacts with the fat molecules and causes the fat to turn blue in that pig so that somebody doesn't accidentally kill that pig and then eat it. They would notice that that blue color. Um, it can have an impact on a few other wildlife species, though. But this smart system can distinguish between a turkey, a deer a pig, a raccoon, and however you program it, 
that's what it'll do. So as a feral pig approaches the camera, it'll open those feeders. And if a deer walks up, it'll recognize that deer and it will close the feeder so the deer can't get any of the poison bait. So anyhow, some new new toys out there on the market to help address that. Um, as we get down to kind of my, end of my presentation here, I just want to point out that it's it's pretty obvious pigs can survive in an extreme environment such as Canada. They're extremely adaptable and uh, to varied climates and habitat types. We've seen them everywhere from deserts to, to mountain forest, um, you know, into subalpine type habitat. Uh, and then I put my little smart comment down there. Where did my where did we build that piglet at? So uh, you can see from that photograph, clo cold climates do not deter these pigs whatsoever. A um, couple of quick photographs that Perry sent me again. Uh, control work in Canada. Uh, you can see in the the four pictures on the outside using various trap techniques to capture pigs in Canada. Uh, game trails in order to to utilize that. Um, and I'm certain Perry and others could give us a lot more detail of what's going on in Canada. But once again, use every tool that's available to you out there. And so remember when differentiating between domestic and wild and feral, use the totality of the circumstances. Look at the characteristics I've talked about today. Use tracks, uh, game trail cameras, all those tools to try to differentiate and, and determine, you know, whether that's a, an escaped domestic pig that a farmer just lost and would like to have back or whether it's a wild or a feral pig and they've started going or are or have reverted to this uh, this wild kind of ancestral state, uh, state, if you will. This is just a quick photograph all the way back from 2002. That's me sitting in the, the left-hand side of the back of the pickup there. And I called in the forces in order to try to start addressing some feral pig issues in Colorado. So I went through that pretty quick, and I know there's got to be some questions out there, and that's kind of the end of my presentation. Um, just real quickly, I'm going to throw up one more slide that has my information, my contact information, my email. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, utilize me. Um, I, I've, I've got 20-plus years' experience dealing with this, and I'm more than happy to help in any fashion that I can. And Marnie, with that, um, do we have any questions? Yes, hang on, we have a question right now. Um, good presentation, Travis. How much of a problem are the hundreds, thousands of small lot domestic swine producers that do not follow BMPs to prevent high risk of contained escapes of pigs, thus seeding an area and presenting opportunities to cross with existing wild feral pig? What programs have you seen that effectively reaches small lot domestic producers to do a better job of containment? And that's that's a great question, whoever asked that, and I appreciate you asking that. Um, currently, between the United States and Canada, and, and Marnie's aware of this as well, there's a transboundary work group uh, coordination going on b between the two um, countries to start addressing feral pig issues and wild pig issues. Um, that's one of the very things that was brought up in that discussion as a, as a problem uh, or a problem statement, if you will. Right now, there really is no way, and it, and it varies from state to state, and I'm certain from country to country, in, in how you control those small domestic pig operations and enforce for example, fencing requirements or containment uh, techniques. Um, I'll use Colorado as an example. In Colorado, domestic pigs fall under our Colorado Department of Agriculture. Uh, they certainly are not wildlife. They don't fall under our jurisdiction. The Department of Ag does not have any, currently does not have any sort of fencing requirements for swine operations. Um, especially those small operations, you know, those those backyard growers that might be growing a pig for, uh, you know, future farmers of America or whatever your equivalent is in Canada, you know, or a 4-H program. Um, so it's, it, it, it's a big problem, in my opinion. Um, uh, additionally, in Colorado, there is no marking requirement for pigs, for domestic pigs. Some states have more stringent requirements that you have to ear notch those pigs or there has to be 
some sort of an ear tag or brand, a freeze mark, some, some marking technique so that they can be identified and the producer can be contacted. Colorado has no such marking requirements. So any domestic pig that escapes containment potentially could go through that reversion process and, and start, you know, populating uh, feral pigs in the, in the wild. So it's a, it's a huge problem. And I, I've kind of danced around the, the answer, I think, Marnie, to that question, but I, I don't know the solution right now. I think getting you know, a, a statewide agreement is a big hurdle to start with and how you address that. And then to try to get that across the United States or across Canada or between the two countries is a is a mountain to climb. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 it certainly is potential. And I'll add to that that I would wager there are people that are intentionally doing that. Um, maybe in order to keep themselves out of trouble, because, it, for example, in Colorado, it is illegal to release swine into the wild intentionally. But I could throw up a really poor fence and say my domestics escaped, right? Um, and really intentionally be releasing pigs into the wild. So did, did that kind of answer it, Marnie, or did I miss a part of that? No, I, th I think that answered Tom's question. Tom, do you have any other um, additional comments or anything like that? Thank you, Tom says. My question for you, Travis, is how is, do you combat the hunting culture in Colorado? Because people, is that a real issue for you down there? It, it absolutely is, Marty, and that's a, that's a great question. And I think that's been proven time and time again. Um, hunters, and I'm a hunter, I'm gonna throw that out there right now. And, and down in Texas, where I grew up and came from, we hunted pigs. Um, it, it's a, it's a great sport. It's a great pastime. Uh, it's a great way to put some, you know, free meat in your freezer. However, it's been proven time and time again, that hunters can actually exacerbate the problem. If you have, especially on smaller isolated populations of pigs, if you have those small pockets of pigs that if you allowed professionals to go in and professionally eradicate those pigs, you could likely get the, the entire group and have them removed from the environment. A hunter going in there and shooting one of those pigs typically scatters that population of pigs and you've, you've just made that problem bigger. Um, additionally, hunting provides a bit of an incentive. Um, it produces a commercial market, if you will. Um, so it can, it can lead to bigger problems by people illegally bringing pigs in just for hunting, um, for distributing those pigs across the landscape so that they can charge people to hunt. Um, so for Colorado, um, no, we did not address it. And, and I'll, I'll explain why. When we initially started this, this fight, or I started this fight, I had nobody on my side. The only people I had on my side were the hunters and most of the landowners. Um, so we actually enlisted the help of hunters and likely made our problem bigger. Um, those hunters probably scattered those pigs up and down, you know, the, the river bottom and made it more difficult as we started gaining momentum and started forming those, those cooperative efforts to address those pigs over time. I will say that, that some states have passed legislation or regulatory language that prohibits hunting for that very reason. They wanted to remove that, that economic incentive. They wanted to remove that, that ability to disperse populations or, or illegally uh, bringing pigs into the state. So Kansas outlawed hunting of pigs. Um, they had a relatively small problem with isolated populations of pigs that they wanted professional eradication versus hunters to remove those animals. So did that kind of touch base on your, your question, Marnie? Yes, it did, thank you. I have another question too, because I, I, I noticed all the different damage in different crop fields. Like how could you, if you just came across that, how could you distinguish that say from, you know, deer damage or, you know, other things that get in there? How, how can someone, actually say with some confidence that uh, yeah that was pigs for sure well i'll go back to what i said the totality of the circumstances right um 
you know, look at that, that particular feeding behavior. If it's a corn field and you see those stalks broke over, that, that's pretty indicative. Um, that's not to say other species can't, you know, break stalks over. But if, but if that's all you're seeing is a bunch of broke over stalks, um, along with tracks that are in that field, if there's a fence on the boundary and you check that fence line and you have mud rubbed on the bottom of that wire or hair snagged in that wire, if you can take some water samples nearby and look at eDNA, you're going to start painting a much better picture of what caused that damage, if you will. Now, I will tell you in, in Colorado, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is liable for damages caused by big game. We are not liable for damage caused by feral pigs, wild pigs, or anything of that nature. Neither is the Department of Agriculture. So it's it's a bit of a sore point. Um, but because we are liable for damages caused by big game, it's very important that we prove that it was pigs versus deer or elk, as an example. Um, so I, I hope that answered that question, Marnie, but it really is the totality of the circumstances. You, you have to look at the bigger picture you know, look at trails coming in there, set up game trail cameras, see if you can actually catch animals in the act. Um, it, it, it wasn't pigs, but I actually dealt with a damage situation where a landowner claimed it was wildlife causing damage and it was actually grasshoppers. We, we were able to go in and prove grasshopper damage versus big game. So um, <laughs> you can do it with some persistence and good investigative skills, you know. All right. Now we have another question from, I think it must be Kevin Harrison. Hey, Tom, what is the ideal habitat to find where these sounders may be bedding? You said, hey, Tom. I assume that was directed at me. Uh, yeah, you. Yeah. Or, or is Tom chiming in? So, <laughs> that, <no>. That's right. <laughs> I realized uh, that, yeah. Travis. Um, <laughs> no, it's a good question. I, I will say that most often, pigs are tied to some sort of water, uh, especially in warmer climates or warmer times of the year, like for cooling down, for drinking, obviously, for staying hydrated. Um, so looking along riparian zones is, is a great place. Um, any sort of kind of swampy areas, there was a particular spot on a ranch in Texas that had uh, these kind of uh, swamps, for the lack of a better term, we always found pigs in those swamps. Uh, it provided hiding cover for them. You know, it obviously provided, uh, you know, habitat for them to avoid other predators. It provided water. It provided uh, wallows, um, shade. So those are always great places to start. But I, I'll go back to what I said earlier. You, you can find pigs in just about any habitat. Um, that one caveat is they, they have to have water. So even in desert environments, there are some some populations of pigs, but there has to be a, a water source there. Um, we found pigs at uh, in Colorado as high as 10,000 feet in elevation. Uh, we found them down at 3,000 feet, uh, 3,500 feet in elevation. So um, the southeast quadrant of the state tends to be a more dry, arid um technically classified as a high desert habitat. Well, that's where we had most of our problems with pigs. Now, part of that's proximity to Kansas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico and Texas, but um, that's just where they were naturally immigrating into the, the state. Um, but like I said, they, they can survive in, in some very extreme environments. Um, you know, the, the, the forest in Canada wouldn't surprise me at all, as long as they, they have those you know, typical things that, that animals need to survive, you know, shelter, water, feed, right? Um, there's not a lot of natural predation on pigs. Um, you know, occasionally one might get killed by a mountain lion or you guys might have grizzlies or something, but um, they, they really don't have many predators, many natural predators. So. All right. Well, thank you. I have another question here. Uh, Emily asks, what have you found to be the best way to detect feral pigs in an area with sporadic sightings over the years, but no known large populations? Camera traps to start, eDNA, et cetera. Do you bait your trail cameras? Yeah, great question. Thanks for that. Um, 
So all of the above. Yeah. We, we, um, later on in this fight in Colorado, we started using eDNA. Um, that was a great tool. We were able to detect the presence of pigs where we had not even seen a single pig, but we had DNA. We knew pigs were coming to that water hole. Um, we used game trail cameras. Um, we did not bait our trail cameras. We actually tried that once. Um, it, it didn't seem to be very effective because we got turkeys and quail and everything else eating the bait. Um, um, but we did use game trail cameras just strategically located. Um, for example, up and down a riparian zone, any place you had a water hole, you saw some of those photographs over a water hole. Um, so we were just documenting, you know, species presence. But along with that, um, and in cooperation with our, our uh, task force partners, if you will, with the United States Department of Agriculture, we had a 1-800 number and we created signs and we put those in every public office, um, you know, in our wildlife offices, in our agricultural offices, um, in the Forest Service office. And, and we put that out there so that the public could report to us potential sightings of pigs. And then we had on the ground experts that would follow up with that caller, go to that specific site and look for tracks, look for scat, look for hair, look, you know, take uh, eDNA samples, anything that we could to confirm the presence of pigs in that particular area. And, and that continues to this day. Um, luckily for the past year and a half, two years, the only reported or potentially reported sightings that I've had were actually escaped domestics. We, we have not documented a single wild or feral pig in the past two years, actually. Excellent, thank you. Um, Darby said here that we find them bedding in cattail sloughs in Saskatchewan, and just as an aside to where their what their ideal habitat is. So, water well, is important. Yeah, and if I can add to that, Marty, that's exactly where I found them in Texas. Quite often, we're in those cattail sloughs. Um, you know, if you, you get in, and especially if that that slough dries up periodically, um, you'll see pigs gather a lot of that cattail detritus and build nest, if you will. Um, and like I said, for anybody listening, I'm still looking for a photograph of the infamous pigloo in, in <laughs> Canada too. So, but I, I would assume it's something similar. You know, they're, they're gathering vegetation to, to build, um, you know, a nest that they're, um, the female anyhow is producing young and, or they're trying to stay warm or provide some sort of cover component. But yes, cattails are a great spot. Excellent. So does anyone else have any more questions? I could ask you questions all afternoon. <laughs> does anybody <laughs> else have any other questions for Travis? Um, I, it doesn't look like there's anyone. So um, Travis, thank you very much for uh, presenting to us. I think it was fantastic. I hope everybody enjoyed it. We did record it. We're going to put it up on our YouTube channel and, and, uh, be able to um, use it for whatever we need to do and stuff like that. Um, so without further ado, um, we will say goodbye to everyone and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks again, Travis. You bet. Thank you everybody for, for being patient listeners. <laughs> Thanks guys. Have a good day.